Okay, so I want to talk to you about a couple of the short stories that you've read. You did All Summer in a Day, and it's about, you know, space travel to other planets. And, you know, that would be great if we could do so. Um, it would be helpful to humanity, yet at the same time, possibly could it be harming? And that's what your essay is about, all about. So all these short stories take place in the future, because obviously for All Summer in a Day, we know Venus, we can't live there. Um, gassy planet, it doesn't rain all day, it's not jungles, okay, but it was an interesting thought, and especially considering, you know, when it was written back in the 50s when Bradbury was huge in writing. Um, then you read By the Waters of Babylon, and that's about your post-apocalyptic place. So we've had like a nuclear war wiped ourselves out, except for those who are remaining have gone back to more like Native American lifestyles. You know, and it's something that's, you know, part of um, all those post-apocalyptic uh, stories. You know, what could happen when we lose technology? What happens when we use technology too quickly? It can harm us, okay? It was helpful, but then it harms. So the Velt takes place in the future. And we have a futuristic society in which technology does everything for us. You know, something that we really like. And this one specifically is about the children and how it affects them and what happens when we let technology just take care of our kids. So I'm gonna read part of it to you, stop a little bit, um, explain some things, but um, here we go. All right, so The Velt was written in, again, 1950, first came up in the Saturday Evening Post popular publication of the time. So the title The Velt, all it means is a savanna like in Africa, savanna um, area, you know, nice prairie. George, I wish you'd look at the nursery. What's wrong with it? I don't know. Well then, I just want you to look at it or call a psychologist and to look at it. What would a psychologist want with a nursery? You know very well what he'd want. His wife paused in the middle of the kitchen and watched the stove busy humming to itself, making supper for four. It's just that the nursery is different now than it was. All right, let's have a look. They walked down the hall of their soundproofed Happy Life home, which had cost them $30,000 installed. Okay, that's cheap, but remember it's 1950, not 2020. That's the price, and that was a lot. This house, which clothed and fed and rocked them to sleep and played and sang and was good to them, their approach sensitized to switch somewhere, and the nursery light flicked on when they came within 10 feet of it. Similarly, behind them in the halls, lights went on and off as they left them behind with the soft automaticity. Well, said George Hadley. They stood on the thatch floor of the nursery. It was 40 feet across by 40 feet long and 30 feet high. It cost half again as much as the rest of the house, but nothing's too good for our children, George had said. The nursery was silent. It was empty as a jungle glade at hot high noon. The walls were blank and two-dimensional. Now, as George and Lydia Hadley stood in the center of the room, the walls began to purr and recede into crystalline distance, it seemed. And presently, an African veil appeared in three dimensions on all sides in color reproduced to the final pebble and bit of straw. The ceiling above them became a deep sky with a hot yellow sun. It's like a really real hologram. George Hadley felt the perspiration start on his brow. Oh, let's get out of this sun, he said. This is a little too real, but I don't see anything wrong. Wait a minute, you'll, you'll see, said his wife. Now the hidden odor phonics were beginning to blow a wind of odor at the two people in the middle of the big belt lamp. The hot straw smell of lion grass, the cool green of a hidden water hole, the rusty smell of animals, and the smell of dust like a red paprika in the hot air. And now the sounds. A thump of distant antelope feet on a grassy sod, the papery rustling of vultures. A shadow passed through the sky. The shadow flickered on George Hadley's upturned sweating face. Filthy creatures, he heard his wife say. The vultures, you see, they're the lions far over that way. Now they're on their way to the water hole. They've just been eating, said Lydia. I don't know what. Some animal, George Hadley, put his hand up to shield off the burning light from his squinted eyes. A zebra or a baby giraffe, maybe. 
Are you sure? His wife sounded peculiarly tense. No, it's a little late to be sure, he said, amused. Nothing over there I can see but cleaned bone and the vultures dropping for what's left. Did you hear that scream, she asked. No, about a minute ago. Sorry, no. The lions were coming, and again George Hadley was filled with the admiration for the mechanical genius who had conceived this room. A miracle of efficiency selling for an absurdly low price. Every home should have one. Oh, occasionally they frightened you with their very clinical accuracy. They startled you, gave you a twinge. But most of the time, what fun for everyone. Not only for your son and daughter, but for yourself. And when you felt like a quick jaunt to a foreign land, a quick change of scenery. Well, here it was. And here were the lions now, 15 feet away, so real. So feverishly and startling real that you could feel the prickling fur on your hand and your mouth was stuffed with the dusty upholstery smell of their heated pelts. And the yellow of them was in your eyes like the yellow of an exquisite French tapestry. The yellows of lions in summer grass and the sound of the matted lion lungs exhaling on the silent noontide and the smell of meat from the panting drooping mouths. The lion stood looking at George and Lydia Hadley with terrible green-yellow eyes. Watch out! screamed Lydia. The lions came running at them. Lydia bolted and ran. Instinctively, George sprang after her, outside in the hall, with the door slammed. He was laughing and she was crying. They both stood appalled at the other's reaction. George! Lydia! Oh, my poor dear sweet Lydia! They almost got us. Walls, Lydia, remember crystal walls? That's all they are? Oh, they look real, I must admit. Africa in your parlor. But it's all dimensional, super reactionary, super sensitive color film and mental tape film behind glass screens. It's all odor phonics and sonics, Lydia. Here's my handkerchief. I'm afraid. She came to him and put her body against him and cried steadily. Did you see? Did you feel? It's too real. Now, Lydia, you've got to tell Wendy and Peter not to read any more on Africa. Of course, of course, he patted her. Promise? Sure. And lock the nursery for a few days until I get my nerves settled. You know how difficult Peter is about that. When I punished him a month ago by locking the nursery for even a few hours, the tantrum he threw. And Wendy, too. They live for the nursery. Think about when your uh, parents take away your uh, gaming uh, stations. It's got to be locked. That's all there is to it. All right. Reluctantly, he locked the huge door. You've been working too hard. You need a rest. I don't know. I don't know. She said, blowing her nose, sitting down in a chair that immediately began to rock and comfort her. Maybe you don't have enough to do. Maybe I have time to think too much. Why don't we shut the whole house off for a few days and take a vacation? Take a vacation from your home. You mean you want to fry my eggs for me? Yes, yeah, she nodded. And darn my socks? Yes. A frantic, watery-eyed nodding. And sweep the house. Oh, yes, yes. Oh, yes. But I thought that's why we bought the house, so we wouldn't have to do anything. That's just it. I feel like I don't belong here. The house is wife and mother now, and nursemaid. Can I compete with an African belt? Can I give a bath and scrub the children as efficiently or quickly as the automatic scrub bath can? I cannot. And it isn't just me. It's you. You've been awfully nervous lately. I suppose I have been smoking too much. You look as if you didn't know what to do with yourself in this house either. You smoke a little more every morning and drink a little more every afternoon and eat a little more sedative every night. You're beginning to feel unnecessary too. Am I? He paused and tried to feel into himself to see what was really there. Oh, George. She looked behind him at the nursery door. Those lions can't get out of there, can they? He looked at the door and saw it tremble as if something had jumped against it from the other side. Oh, of course not, he said. Mm, seems a little strange. At dinner, they ate alone, for Wendy and Peter were at a special carnival across town and bad televised, and bad televised home to say they'd be late to go ahead eating. 
So George Hadley bemused at watching the dining room table produce warm dishes of food from its mechanical interior. We forgot the ketchup, he said. Sorry, said a small voice within the table, and ketchup appeared. As for the nursery, thought George Hadley, it won't hurt for the children to be locked out of it for a while. Too much of anything isn't good for anyone. And it was clearly indicated that the children had been spending a little too much time on Africa. That sun, he could feel it on his neck, still like a hot paw. And the lions, the smell of blood. Remarkable how the nursery caught the telepathic emotions of the children's mind and created a life to fill their every desire. The children thought lions and there were lions. The children thought zebras and there were zebras. Sun, sun, giraffes, giraffes. Death and death. That last. He chewed tastelessly on the meat that the table had cut for him. Death thoughts. They were awfully young, Wendy and Peter, for death thoughts. Or no, you were never too young, really. Long before you knew what death was, you were wishing it on someone else. When you were two years old, you were shooting people with cap pistols. But this, the long, hot African belt, the awful death in the jaws of a lion, and repeat it again and again. Where are you going? He didn't answer Lydia. Preoccupied, he let the lights glow softly on ahead of him, extinguished behind him as he padded to the nursery door. He listened against it. Far away, a lion roared. He unlocked the door and opened it. Just before he stepped inside, he heard a faraway scream and then another roar from the lions, which subsided quickly. He stepped into Africa. How many times in the last year had he opened this door and found Wonderland? Alice, the Mock Turtle, or Aladdin and his Magical Lamp, or Jack Pumpkinhead of Oz, or Dr. Doolittle, or the cow jumping over a very real appearing moon. All the delightful contraptions of a make-believe world. How often had he seen Pegasus flying in the sky ceiling, or seen fountains of red fireworks, or heard angel voices singing. But now, in the yellow hot Africa, this bake oven with murder in the heat, Perhaps Lydia was right. Perhaps they needed a little vacation from the fantasy which was growing a bit too real for 10-year-old children. It was all right to exercise one's mind with gymnastic fantasies, but when the lively child mind settled on one pattern, it seemed that at a distance for the past month, he had heard lions roaring and smelled their strong odor seeping as far away as his study door. But being busy, he had paid it no attention.